This is a big day. This is the most important day in the history of the world, the fact that our Savior was raised to life. And this isn't just a myth or some superstition. We have eyewitness testimony. We can believe when people say they've seen things. Why can't we believe it just because it's a book that we don't always want to believe? Uh, you know, it's, it's funny how that works. We'll believe ancient historians, little scraps of paper, but multiple eyewitness accounts for some reason just rub us wrong. And I think it has to do something with the law of God and his standard. But, you know, I could be mistaken on that. Anyway, welcome if you're here for the first time. <clears throat> if you're joining us online, I know a lot of people do. On the holidays, we seem to get quite a bit of views, and probably some of that's just people poking around to see what everybody else is doing. No, we're not having Easter egg drops or anything like that, but we're here to celebrate our Savior's life. The fact that he gave it for us and took it up again is more than enough to entice me to want to be with the body of Christ on, on Resurrection Sunday. I don't need Easter eggs for that. I got plenty of those at home, right? Yes, so we're going to read a, a large section here. Let's take a look. John 20, starting in verse 1. <clears throat> now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They've taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they've laid him. So Peter and the other disciple went forth, and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first, and stooped, and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. And so Simon Peter also came following him and entered the tomb, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then also entered, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. <clears throat> so the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping, and so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they've laid him. When she'd said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I'll take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, stop clinging to me, for I have not as yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my father and your father, and my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came, announcing to the disciples, I've seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, this is the big day. This is where it all comes together, your redemptive plan. Lord, for some of us, whether we're saved or not, faith is hard to come by. We struggle. We get blinded by other things. We have so many voices speaking at us that, Lord, it is hard for us to believe at times. I pray that this morning, by the power of your Spirit, that you'll strengthen weak faith, that you'll open blind eyes, that you'll open and unstop deaf ears this morning, that you'll show prisons for what they are, and that you'll, most importantly, show yourself for who you are. I ask these things in the name of your precious Son, Jesus. Amen. Well, you'll have to forgive me. My mouth is dry. They got me on some medication or something, so I'll be swigging tea all day. I need to do a, I was sitting around sick all day, so I was watching like old wrestling, you know, like Hulk Hogan and stuff. I need, to, I need two iced teas and I can just smash them open and pour them in my mouth <clears throat> after a successful sermon, right? <laughs> Get up on the, <laughs> it remains to be seen whether or not this will be one of those. So <laughs> welcome, it's good to have you here. It really is good to see everybody. I miss you and it's hard not to be here on Wednesdays. And I appreciate the fact that we have so many 
people that are able to fill in the gaps here. It doesn't all depend on one person. That's the way it should be. But man, it sure does feel good to be the one able to be up here. So usually what we do, we like to go verse by verse and just take it slow. But thinking about the resurrection, I just love this story, and I love John's version of it. We, we have an eyewitness, and you see some of these little details that if you remember traumatic events, big events in your life, and there's always little details that you pick up, little things that you remember, things like the face covering that he remembers, and it was folded, and it was sitting in a place by itself. That, that's indicative of that eyewitness account. Love that in John. But what I want to do today is instead of <clears throat> breaking down every verse, I see a lot of things in here that really just speak to us as a church. I want to kind of retell this and just make a few notes on the way through. We'll stop back through it as we go. I don't have scriptures for you on slides or anything today. I just want to stay right here with the resurrection story. So we're thinking about where we're at in our context. And after the events of the Lord's crucifixion, he had a few faithful followers. We all know the story. They were allowed to take his body to the tomb of a man named Joseph. And Luke tells us that it was a new tomb, and we'll get to there eventually, uh, which helps us understand some of the confusion in this text. It's a brand new tomb. And very likely, it was a temporary holdover. Christ was crucified right before the Sabbath day. There's nothing they can do on the Sabbath. So very likely, he offered this tomb as a place to lay the body until they could figure out what they're going to do with it, which is a beautiful thing. Well, they're sitting there while Sabbath's going on, and Mary Magdalene and a few other women, Luke tells us in Luke 23, early Sunday morning before daybreak, and we'll look at the, the times and the contradictions and all that once we get there in Luke. I don't want to mess with any of that today. I don't want to take away from this story at all. It's before daybreak. We can agree on that. They're headed to the tomb to finish preparing the Lord's body for where it's going to be buried, whether it's in that tomb or somewhere else. So they arrive. Think of, put yourself at the story here. So these women get up. The sun's not even yet risen, but it's her early morning. Mary Magdalene and these other women that she's with, that Luke tells us about, they go up there, and they, they arrive to where the tomb is, and they immediately they see the stones moved. Panic set in. They must have been thinking, oh, no, we missed it. We weren't here when they have opened the tomb that's, that was sealed. The body's been moved. So without a moment's pause at all, without going up to see anything, they run off. That's what John tells us. And, and Mary, we don't know where the others went, but Mary goes straight to where the apostles are staying. She must be in a panic telling them what happened because this is a big event. She gets there, and so John and Peter, and often they're pictured together. We see them in the book of Acts. They must have had a really close relationship. And they obviously are the ones, as two of the leaders of this group, they go just sprinting off to see what's going on here at the tomb? This hysterical woman's come to us and told us the stone's gone. And so they go to investigate for themselves. And John is the younger of the two. Peter, he's a fisherman. He's muscle bound. He's been on a boat all his life, but he's an older guy. John, he's a kid. He's probably a teenager sprinting off and John pulls ahead. And you got to love the humility of John as he writes his gospel. Doesn't even want to mention his name. He's just so respectful and so reserved. And he's the younger of the two and he pulls ahead and he gets there first. And either out of respect for a gravesite or out of shyness or just because of the way he's made, he stays outside, but he peeks down in. And he sees these grave wrappings rolled up and set down in place. Now, Peter, he's by nature, we know him, he's a little bit more brash, and he doesn't hesitate. Peter gets there and just marches straight down into the stairs. Rabbinical history says, and we've looked at some of the law and how you can be uh, considered unclean touching a grave. But the Torah has some teaching in it that's kind of interesting. I saw a just man, a just man's grave doesn't make you unclean. Kind of interesting. So these two men are there, and Peter rushes on down. It's just his nature without any kind of hesitation. And he sees the linens rolled up, just like John saw. But because he's gone all the way in, he sees the cloth that's covered the Lord's head also rolled up and laid in a separate place. He notices that. Now, it's obvious this isn't the site of a transfer of a body from one place to another. No well-meaning Jews touching a dead body anyway, especially one that's unwrapped. And even Roman soldiers who, if anybody's used to handling dead bodies, it's them. But if you're going to move a body, you're still going to leave it wrapped. Why uncover the thing, right? 
it's evidence that this isn't a grave robbery. This isn't a transfer. Something's happened here. Nothing underhanded would have happened to take grave clothes off. If something like that would have been the case, you'd just take it and run. There's no reason to spend time to uncover the body, to go through rolling up the clothes, to, to take the mask off and also fold that up and set it down. There's no time for any of that if this is a grave robbery. So as Peter is down in the tomb, John's telling us this story. John feels safe now to go join him. And I was thinking about this. Maybe Peter called up and beckoned him to come down in. Hey, John, you've you got to see this. Or maybe John's just emboldened now that Peter's there because he's the more backward of the two. But either way, John gets down into the tomb with him. And, the, and what the two saw before them sparked something that John says in verse 9. They see this, and for as yet they did not understand Scripture that he must rise again from the dead. But verse 8 tells us, so the other disciple that had first come to the tomb then also entered, and what? He saw and believed. He sees the evidence, and now he believes. It all starts to hit him. Suddenly, all the times that Jesus quoted the prophets, all the Scripture they already knew, but it hadn't really understood and how many of us have been in a position like that? We know our scripture, but there comes a time it's said or it's sung or you're talking to another disciple and in their own paraphrase, it clicks. And that's what happened for these two. We get to see the moment when it dawns on them that all these things that Jesus has said, okay, now it makes sense. And I was thinking, what must have come to their mind? Because they knew their scripture. I was thinking of things like Psalm 2, 7, and 8. that says, I'll surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you're my son. Today I've begotten you. Ask of me and I'll surely give you the nations as your inheritance. He's not here. Oh my goodness, what could this mean? Or like Psalm 1610, for you'll not abandon my body to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. They're seeing this and thinking these. They're believing. The scripture's coming alive for these two. So like a flood now, it's all making sense to these two disciples. The Word of God coming alive. And there's nothing like that, is there? When the Word of God just comes alive to you, it's to you. It's not to somebody else now, it's to you. And that's what happens to these. It's a thrill when the Spirit of God illuminates scriptures to us, and it had to have been to them because they were so heartbroken that their master, their friend, is gone. And for it to all culminate right there in an empty tomb like this, Something happens to us. We know the feeling, light bulb clicks because of maybe someone's testimony, maybe because of their example, or maybe you hear something expounded in a sermon. It never ceases to amaze me how I'll say something a hundred times over, but one day it clicks with one person, and they'll get a hold of me on a Monday and say, you know, you said this, and it, it opened up. It's such a wondrous thing. It never gets old, and that's what happens. And that's why it's so valuable to share our testimony and share our faith because it could be your faith, your paraphrase of a scripture, your example of what God's done that sparks it in somebody else. It's just amazing to see how God can work through all of these different things, a hymn that we sing, and it clicks with you that day. But when it happens, there's no taking it from you. When it happens to you, nobody can convince you otherwise because you've seen it. It's come alive to you, and it's there now. You can fight it, you can push it, you can resist but there's nothing doing. When the scripture is opened up, it's open. And up until that point, those of you that have had this happen, it feels as if you've understood the faith. It feels as if you've understood the scripture. But after it happens, when the word really comes alive to you, truly does, you almost wonder if you're even saved before it happened because it's so real, right? That Chad and I, Jeremy and I, we've talked about this so many times where it happens to us, but that's the work of the spirit opening eyes, and growing weak faith into strong faith. That's amazing, and only God can do that. So these two disciples we see here, they're satisfied or excited, or maybe they're realizing that before too much longer, somebody else is going to come over here and see this, this stone has been moved, and they're going to start asking questions. Maybe for all those reasons, none of those reasons, I don't know, but they're ready to go back. We see it here, the disciples in verse 10 went away to their own homes. Peter and John, they're, they're out of the picture, but Mary was outside. Now, no doubt, when she went and told these disciples and they went sprinting off to the tomb, she's 
running behind him. Now, she's probably not as fast as either of those two. Somewhere along the line while they've been down to tomb, she got back. She's outside. We don't know that they passed each other. Did they see? We don't need to know. But she's outside, and no doubt she was well behind them because these guys were booking. But she's here now, and we don't know where the other women are at this point. Probably still on her way back. Our text only just presents Mary by herself. But look at her. She's grief-stricken, and she's in shock. She'd been planning to go and prepare Jesus' body for burial all day without being able to do, lift a finger to do anything about it. Here they are. They've, they've come to this. But there's something that happens when you lose somebody that you love sometimes. And those of you that have lost people, you, you, you know the feeling. You still want to care for them even though they're gone, you know? Those of you that have ever dealt with that. I remember when my brother passed, wanting to clean his apartment out. Didn't matter. He's gone. But you just still want to do something. It's, you can't quite let go yet. And so here she is, and her intention is to do something for him. He's done so much for her. And so here she is, and she can't because he's, he's gone. She can't do what she's preparing to do. She's sitting there holding her supplies. After waiting all through the Sabbath when she can't work, she's waiting and planning. She's probably so excited. It was probably nothing to get up that morning. She probably didn't sleep Sabbath night. So before dawn, her and those other women, they set out to do what could be done, and they were ready. They wanted to be there probably for whoever might show up so they'd be there to meet them, so they'd be able to get in there and and do what they had planned. But now what's she going to do? Tomb's open. He's gone. Talk about a, a gut punch. And unlike her first visit to the property, where she just saw the stone, panicked, and ran off, this time he says she's standing outside in verse 11. So as she wept, she stooped down and looks into the tomb. So this time she looks down, and God opens her eyes to see who's been sitting in the tomb this whole time. There's two angels sitting in white, one where our Lord's head rested and one where his feet had been. And another indication of a new tomb. Tombs were hewn out of the rock like a little vault. And as needed, they would carve out sections in the wall, just enough to put a body in. Well, our Lord's body hadn't been placed in that, but most likely on the floor or maybe on a pallet or a cot. There There wouldn't be enough room for angels to sit in one of those. Another little detail an eyewitness account. So these two angels, they're charged with watching over the Son of God as his body laid in the tomb. How cool is that? The scripture says in Psalm 91, 11, and it's interesting because this is one of the verses that Satan tried to use to get our Savior to speed up the plan of redemption. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Comes to mind when I see this. Even in this way, as the Lord's body is wrapped, and sitting in a tomb for two days in the dark. Angels are there, keeping watch. One of them speaks to Mary with this kind of angelic indifference. You see it here in verse 13. Not understanding why she'd be crying at the sight of an empty tomb. Have you thought about that? They don't understand why. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense to them why you'd cry over something like this. Woman... Why are you weeping? These angels are <clears throat> angels that Peter talks about who, in his first epistle, he says that angels long to look into God's way of redeeming man. They never get tired of looking into it. And these are two of these angels. Grief doesn't register with these two. If there's any form of sadness over an empty tomb, it's lost on these two angels. It doesn't compute. They're, they're, these are guardians that have been sitting there the, watching a body that's now no longer there. Maybe even two of the same angels that joined shepherds over a field close to Bethlehem with a joyful announcement 33 years before to say that the Son of God is here. Grief does not enter their mind. It's not a sad occasion for them. This is the triumph of all triumphs as far as they're concerned. He says, woman, why are you crying? And Mary's so grief-stricken. 
She isn't even shaken by the fact that she's seeing two angelic beings right in front of her. She's so single-mindedly focused on her missing Jesus. She says, they've, they've taken him, and I don't know where they've taken him to. That's as far as it gets. She turns from him to see another one standing there. She's totally not overwhelmed at all by the sight of these two. And I wonder, even when she turned, like, why? Did she see the angel's attention direct from her to something behind? Did she maybe hear something? Or maybe just that, you know how it is when you can tell somebody's behind you? For whatever reason, she gives up on the conversation with the angels. Maybe she just wasn't interested in anything they had to say because it wasn't about where the body of Jesus was. But she turns around, she turns immediately, and thinks this is the property manager, and nobody else would be there this early. If anybody knew where Jesus' body would be, it would have to be the caretaker of the property. Joseph was a rich man. He had people taking care of his property for him. He didn't look over those day-to-day -day kind of details. So the, Joseph, being a rich man, would have had caretakers for any of his property. And Mary is assuming through her tears that that must be who this is. She doesn't even recognize Jesus. And that's all we can take from this. I, the text doesn't say that his form was unrecognizable. And I've heard some of the silly theories, and maybe you have too. It doesn't say that his clothes were the clothes of a gardener. I've seen paintings even where he's in the loincloth that he was crucified in, holding a shovel. It doesn't say anything about that. That's all just silly theory imported into a text that's not here. All it tells us is that Mary thought that's who it was. So Jesus speaks to her, and these are probably the first words he's spoken since he opened his eyes in a dark tomb and stepped out of it. Don't miss this. Jesus, whose famous first teaching, the Sermon on the Mount, has to do with things like, uh, when you look at the Beatitudes, blessed are those who mourn, right? And that the meek will inherit the earth. This is our Jesus. Same Jesus who was moved to tears when his friend Lazarus is in his own gravesite, when he sees what sin has done, and he sees the sisters and the fallout from losing someone. This is the same Jesus, and this is the first thing he's done since opening his eyes. His first words, this one that's the God-man who so deeply cares for people and so moved when he sees people ravaged by the effects of sin, whether it's a healing, whether it's demon possession, whether it's death, his first words, they're intended to console and comfort. To a woman that's suffering the worst of all human sorrow, and we all know what it feels like, the finality of death and the loss that it brings, woman, why are you weeping? First concern. And this is really the beginning of even further fulfillment of promise that we have in Christ when, it, when he'll himself wipe every tear away from their eyes, starting already right here. But he asked her another question. Whom are you seeking? She hasn't lost something. She's lost someone. Jesus has been asking this question ever since. Whom are you seeking? We grasp at this and that in search of peace, in search of joy, in search of purpose and fulfillment. We're running from here to there. We're trying whatever we can to bring what it is that we're looking for. We talked about it a little bit last week. And we fail to find it over and over until a lot of us end up just like Mary, lost, interior-eyed, confusion, just frustrated and lost. He asks us the same thing. Well, she answers this one who she thinks is the caretaker. Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I'll take him away. Note the single-mindedness of Mary here. She's going to handle the body all by herself, she thinks. She doesn't answer who she's looking for. She doesn't say, I'm looking for Jesus. Her, the Lord is so full in her mind, it's implied. Who else could she be talking about, right? It's the Lord. Maybe she assumed he heard the conversation with the two angels. Maybe she's just so focused on the Lord at that moment that it doesn't occur to her that anybody else wouldn't know who she's looking for because this is so important to her. In fact, she's so singularly focused on Jesus, she thinks she can go pick up the body and handle it wherever it is. If, if she could only know where to go get it, this woman who in no way would be able by herself to handle a body and carry it off believes right now she could do it if she could only know where it is. Now, 
I wonder what must have been rushing through her mind that's got her so shaken up. She must have known the, the, the tomb was a temporary spot because that had to be why she arrived so early. She didn't want to miss opening the tomb. She didn't want to run a risk that something might happen while they're not there. And if you think about it, in those days, crucified bodies, they were thrown off a cliff into a valley called Hinnom where they burned trash. There's a good chance that had they not been there, and this could have been thoughts running through their mind. You sure wouldn't want Jesus' body to be thrown in with the criminals. So she had to have been just thinking all kinds of things, which is why they were there. I wonder if that thought maybe had been weighing on her all Sabbath day when she's powerless to do anything. She's blind to everything else to the point of recklessness, thinking she can handle a body all by herself. In her mind, the question, whom do you seek, isn't even a question, because who else would it be? For the woman, the same woman who was once enslaved by demons, and the first words she heard from Christ were setting her free. She was possessed and driven to Lord knows what until Jesus of Nazareth one day approaches her and says in his unmistakable voice that she can be free, that she's pardoned, that her sins are forgiven. This is the woman that's now at the tomb, the woman who had been forgiven of so much and in turn had loved so much. The scripture tells us of that. So much so that she once broke a jar of really expensive perfume on Jesus' feet and then rinsed it with her own tears. This is the woman now looking for Jesus. She loves him. What a beautiful picture of the Lord's first interaction. You get a heart that's crushed by grief, desperate, without any form of hope to speak of, and that's the one who hears the announcement that death has been defeated. But until now, she's been too preoccupied with her mission. She's, she's too blinded by tears to hear anything, to even understand what's going on, to process any of this. And what a beautiful thing to know that it wasn't a scholar, it wasn't a scribe, it wasn't a theologian, it wasn't a priest, it was a doubter. It was a doubter that was in despair and brokenhearted, who didn't even know Jesus when she saw him, who was the first to see him face to face. And he breaks into this darkness. She's, she's stuck, and he breaks right through it with, Mary, that's the voice that commanded her freedom years ago. That's the voice that defended her act of worship when everybody else thought the expense was too high. The one who knew everything about her past, who knew all her thoughts, who knew her heart, who knew her devotion. She knew that voice. She knew that Galilean accent. That's him. It's like the song of songs, the one who my soul loves, who's seen him. She found him. His sheep all know his voice. That's what it says. Mary, isn't it just like our Lord? How often is it the same with us? We struggle and we fight And we're searching in darkness for him, even though we're his, and we search in so many places, and we bring on so much suffering to ourselves, stumbling and grasping. But in our brokenness and defeat, the voice of God thunders through when he calls our name, doesn't it? So she turned at some point during this, after she thought he was the gardener, she turned at some point, but she was lost in her grief. But after she hears her name, this time she sees him for who he is. She says, Rabbani, that's... One of three variations of that word, rab, is master. Rabbi is my master. Rabbanai is the most exalted of all. That's my honored and esteemed master. You didn't throw that title around. Scribes weren't called Rabbanai. Very, very seldom in the Old Testament is that word ever used. And John puts a little note on, on his Verse 16, which means teacher. He's writing to a Greek audience. He doesn't want them to lose it either. This isn't just a common word. This is her master. So in her joy, she burst out with this. Rabbi, her master, not just the man, but one who was just dead, now he's alive, standing right in front of her. She'd seen the miracles. She experienced one herself. She heard his teachings. She'd witnessed his power. He wasn't just a man deserving of honor as some teacher. He's truly the son of the Most High God. He's deity 
and he's standing here alive in front of her. And in her joy, maybe she wanted to fall at his feet like she used to always do and hug his knees. That was a sign of respect. That's what women always did to these esteemed rabbis. They'd fall at their feet and wrap their arms around their ankles. Maybe she started to want to do that before, but he stops her. And again, you hear silly theories that he wasn't fully formed yet or that he's still in pain from his crucifixion, stuff like that, reading between the lines and pulling up all kinds of things that aren't there, all baseless, all imported into the text. Are we to think that the, this woman's not allowed to touch when just a moment, a few moments later, he's going to allow one of his disciples to put his hands all over him? I think not. The theories are nonsense. Look at his words in verse 17. Jesus said to her, stop clinging to me. That's the word. The NASB, I like the rendering there because it explains it. Stop clinging. You can't hold on to this. As if to say, there's no time to waste. You can't hold on to this. I'm back. I'm alive, but I'm not going to be staying forever. You can't have it the old way because something better is coming, Mary. And it reminds me of back in Luke 10 when he sent the 70 out and he told them, don't even stop to greet people on the road. There's no time to waste. We have a message to send. And it's a similar feeling I get here. This is big. We don't have time to be hugging my feet, Mary. You can't cling to this. We have a message to send, right? It's not going to be like it was. But this is the greatest moment in world history. The victorious sun has risen for his people. And not only that, but, but the familiar days are over. The time being spent alongside the master, living life, eating meals, finding places to sleep at night, those days are coming to an end for something better. His ascension has already begun. The moment his eyes opened in the tomb, the ascension has started. He's, and he says it here, I've not yet ascended, but it has begun. The moment he took his life back up, it begun, and it'll conclude when he's seated at the right hand of the Father. But for now... She and the rest of the disciples, they have to learn that he's not here to stay. He's not here to overthrow Rome. Those dreams have got to go away. The kingdom has come. And he's going to send his own spirit, not just to live with them, but to live in them. Never to be separated again. Never to part ways again. But his own spirit, his essence, to live with them, in them, to dwell in them, to dwell together forever. You can't cling to this, Mary, is what he's saying. But you can cling to the one that he's going to send. What a promise is that to us? And what he says next is just as beautiful in 17. Go tell my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my father and your father, and my God and your God. I love that saying. I often use that when I open in prayer. He's our Father, and he's our God, because he is Christ's Father and Christ's God. Now, these disciples, he calls them brethren here. They've been called servants. They've been called slaves. They've been called weak of faith. They've been called disciples. They've been called, some of them, apostles, even friends. But this, to the ones who scattered when he was arrested, in his darkest valley, they were shrieking back. These are the ones who had fallen asleep when he's sweating great drops of blood. In Peter's case, he even denied to know the man. Go tell my brothers, he says. What concern he has for the hurting that he loves. He hasn't lost his humanity. He's come out of the tomb. He's exalted. This is as exalted as he'll ever be, the radiant Christ. But he's still human. He still has his human nature. To this day, as he sits at the right hand of the Father, he still sits, yes, God, and also man. Which is why Hebrews 2 says that he's not ashamed to call us brethren. And because we are his brethren, he's ours. That means his Father, spiritually speaking, is also our father by adoption. And humanly speaking, his God is also our God through Christ. What an assurance we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And, and he says to Mary to tell all the disciples and us as well, go tell them all, go tell my brethren that though we were forsakers of his, deniers of his, even as he's raised in glory, he hasn't forgotten us and he hasn't loved us any less than when he's truly revealed in his majesty still. Verse 18, Mary leaves him to tell the others. And can you imagine what relaying this must have been like? Because she hears what they saw. You guys saw the wrappings too. You saw the head covering. I saw the Lord. What a beautiful thing. We're going to take communion, and I want you to stay seated. They're going to bring it to you and just pass it down the aisles. Have you seen the Lord? Has he called your name? Are you too heartbroken to hear it this morning because you're looking to so many other things to find this? Are you stumbling around trying to find peace and comfort and joy and relief? Look, I'm telling you, I have been there thinking the whole thing is a joke. Grew up hearing this all my life. I had seen so many Christians fail, and I was able to use that as an excuse for years and years and years. And I tried it. I tried it myself, right? I went to the front before I'd prayed. And nothing happened to me. But there did come a day as I'd been getting dealt with, because it was one of those things that you can't forget and you almost wish you could. You wish you could never hear it. And if that's you, if, if you were ever wishing you hadn't heard it, because no matter what you've done in your life and no matter what you do, you just can't seem to outrun this nagging little voice. Friends, that's, that's God drawing his own, and you'll never outrun it. There is no outrunning it. I've tried, and I ran as far as I could run. But there came a day that he called my name, and I didn't seek him. He sought me. He came to me. He broke me, and he was there to lift my head. He's made a covenant with us, and that's what we're passing out right now as a reminder of who we are in him. And it's a physical reminder that because his body was broken, because his blood was shed, we can all have forgiveness of sins. And a covenant is a promise that because of what he's done, what we've done can be forgiven. That's the promise he makes. Because of what I've done for you. Now, what we've learned on Wednesday nights, we talk about covenants a lot. So often covenants are one-sided. This is a one-sided covenant. This is Christ living a life that you can't live and I can't live for the sole purpose of redeeming ones that couldn't live it. It's a one-sided covenant offer saying, bring your sin, bring your failure, bring your shame, bring all of it to me, and I'll ex in exchange to give you my righteousness. You can't earn it. You can't work it up. You can't prove worthy of it. It's a free gift for failures. But maybe you, today you're like the disciples. It's just a matter of the word being brought to life in you. Maybe it hasn't. Maybe it hasn't come alive. By a testimony of Christ's presence in a life, it can. Someone sitting right next to you, maybe. Somebody that you thought you knew. Somebody that you saw destroyed their life. That you watched fall apart in front of you disgraced and shamed and humiliated, but you've also seen a transformation that can't be denied, just like the disciples that go into a tomb and they see something on the floor that can't be denied. Maybe you've been running, but maybe there is someone that's a saint of God that lives close to you, maybe with you, maybe a neighbor, a friend, someone that you see here. Maybe you've seen a change in them. I encourage you to think on that today. They didn't do that on their own. They can't. It doesn't stick. It won't hold. But maybe that's you. Maybe you've seen a transformation that can't be denied. That's a supernatural work of God bringing to life something that was once dead. And let that same truth that rang true in that person ring true for you. The promise of new life to all who submit themselves to God in Christ. Look around the room. Think of some of the people and some of the testimonies here. You can't deny the change that you see sitting around you in some of these. 
I can't. Let that truth change you as well. Stop resisting the Spirit and let the evidence speak. We don't become Christians because we want to be good. We become Christians because we're miserable prisoners who God owes nothing but judgment to, that by his own mercy and grace calls our name. It's as simple as that. Or maybe you're more like Mary today. Maybe you've been close to the Lord for a long time. You've been following. Maybe not a long time. Maybe just a short time like Mary. But maybe you've been close to him long enough, but lately it's as if you can't seem to find him. It's like he's been taken away from you and you don't know where. So you've been scraping and grasping at things, other things. You're, you're desperate to recover that enjoyment and that joy of our salvation. But for a while now, maybe his presence to you has been elusive. And the more you search, the more you look, the more he seems lost. The risen Christ ascended to fill all things. He's an ever-present Savior. He's not been lost. He's not been hidden. You just haven't been looking at him with clear eyes. I want to take some time to pray that the Lord will be able to push through that with you, just like he's done for me. This isn't a life that most of us would even wish, friends. We don't wake up one day and say, I want to resist everything the world's ever told me. I want to unlearn everything I've ever learned. I want my own family, even in some cases, to not understand and possibly disown me. That's not what we've chosen. It's because we don't choose. He does. The pull we feel is not indoctrination. The pull we feel is not old Sunday school lessons that have just been drilled in and need worked out. Those are grains of truth that you cannot and you will not outrun. Jesus said himself, all that the Father gives me will come. We can come kicking and screaming, or we can bow the knee. We don't clean ourselves up first. It's impossible. He does the cleaning. We don't stop wanting the things we wanted. He takes that from us. There's absolutely nothing you can do to prepare yourself other than bow and offer your failure, your sin, your disgrace, your shame. He gladly takes it. Let's just take a moment to pray. Just pray on your own. Ask him to show himself to you. Lord God, so many of us have scrambled and stumbled and brought on so much onto ourselves that we don't recognize you when we see you right in front of us. We've seen lives transformed. We don't even recognize it. We've seen our own family, in some cases, God, be totally renewed. But we still can't see the Jesus that's right before us. Lord, I ask that you'll break through that today. We've passed off these drawings and nudgings as indoctrination and as old things we've learned. Lord, help us see that for what it is this morning. 
It's seeds of truth that you yourself have planted. You can't be denied. You won't be denied. So, Lord, I pray that those of us that are here that have been struggling and pushing against, who have our rebellious spirit crushed this morning under the weight of who we are and what we've done, as well as who you are and what you've done, that we'll bow. Before we take communion, I want to read, I wasn't sure if I wanted to do this, but I'm going to read Isaiah 53, why we do this. Why would we do this? Why why are we holding a cup and having bread? And what does this have to do with, with the crucifixion? Well, this is an apologetic from God himself. <clears throat> God has given us all of this because he loves you. He's not a tyrant. He's not a despot. He's a creator who's made a creation that does nothing but rebel. And he keeps extending and extending and extending mercy to the point where he sends his own to take our place. He has created a standard that is impossible for us to reach, and he knows that. So he sent a Messiah to do the impossible for you and for me. Isaiah 45, thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed. 45, I don't want 45, 53, I'm sorry, I was reading another one as well. Got Isaiah on the brain this morning. Who's believed our message? And don't we ask this? In whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? I think I ask myself this every Sunday. Lord, we give him the truth. It's up to you. So let God explain the redemption plan to you. For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He had no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, no appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. That's the look of our Savior. Just like us, you'd walk right past. He's nothing special. In fact, he was more the other way. He was despised. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He looked like someone who was cursed by God, not someone who's blessed, not a son, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we're healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. We talk once in a while about the wrath of God and the fact that we commit sin, and as we do, God stores up wrath because he's a just God. He can't be just and not deal with sin. Our sin wasn't just given to Jesus on a cross. Our iniquity, the Lord God, took and caused to fall on the Lord Jesus as he hangs. The crushing weight of my sin, every one that I've ever committed, as well as you and you, all who would come to Christ fell onto him. And I can't imagine the separation feeling that our Lord must have felt. And now we can understand why he would say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's why all of our sins fell onto him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he didn't open his mouth. No defense given. He took it all. An innocent man took sin that wasn't his 
like a lamb that's led to slaughter and like a sheep that's silent before its shearers. He didn't open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. God loves us so much, yet he has to punish sin because he's a just God. Rather than punish us, who the stroke was due, he offered his own son to take it for you. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in death because he'd done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. Can you imagine those of you that are parents being pleased to destroy your own But God could do it if he would render himself as a guilt offering. He will see his offspring. He will prolong his days. And the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. The joy is set before him. Beyond is you. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death. He was numbered with the transgressors, yet he, bore, yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded to the transgressors. And that is why we take communion to remember that our Lord, the sinless lamb, who has done nothing wrong, takes like a lamb to slaughter, not a peep, the guilt of all of us, allowed his back to be laid open, allowed his beard to be pulled, allowed himself to be blindfolded and punched while he's spat on and asked, prophesy who did that. He lowered himself, the one who'd been nothing but glorified, to be spat on for what I've done to him. That doesn't make sense to me but because that's the love that I can't comprehend. Such is the love of our Lord God, that he would send his son to go through and endure all that he did, to have his body broken for us. And Lord, we thank you as we hold the bread, that you would stoop to our level and beyond, beneath, to be broken for us, to be bruised for us, to take the blows that were rightly designated for us upon yourself without ever opening your mouth once to complain, without ever opening your mouth to justify, even though you were completely justifiable. Lord, we thank you as we hold the bread and we take and eat. And as our God does this to his own son, pleased to do it, there came a point where even he turns away. The unbearable amount of sin, when even one is unbearable in the presence of our God, all laid on this precious, holy, righteous one, poured out. And then God's judgment poured out as the blood of our Lord runs down a tree on the side of a road. Naked on a city street, hanging on a tree. The shame in that, in a culture that reserved, in a culture as open as ours, I can't imagine. But again, he's looking ahead. He's willing to endure that for the joy set before him, and that's you. That's you. And when he found you, where were you? Every bit as ugly as that scene. But life is in the blood, and he gave life, all of his life, all the way to the blood, so that you and I could have eternal life with him, so we could be called his brothers, his sisters, his family. And as we take the cup, Lord, we thank you that your son willingly took this on himself. He didn't have to do this. You have no reason that I can see, God, 
that you would save us other than your willingness to love us. We have nothing to offer you but our sin. And you had so much to give away to redeem us from the slavery we were in. Lord, we thank you. And as we hold the cup, we remember. And as we drink, we thank you for your precious blood spilled for us. Communion is a grace of God. He gives us something to hold because he knows that we stumble around without evidence. He, he gives us something. But I want you to remember, this is a, a spiritual cleansing. And when we come to faith, so much of it falls away, so much of the old us. But you're not, you're still you. He's created you and he loves you. The parts that need to change, he changes. We, we can't manufacture this. You can't pretend to be something you're not. But if you've heard something today, if you've been being drawn, let today be the day. Don't, don't end the day that our Savior is commemorated as stepping out of his grave. Don't end it still dead in sin, still in prison. You don't have to be. I know you think you're free, but freedom is outside the prison, not inside it. I pray that God opens all of our eyes to see him for who he is, us for who we are, so that we can live being salt and light for him. What a thankfulness. What a... But if you don't understand salvation, if you don't know if you're saved, please, please don't leave. Please come and talk to us. I don't do altar calls. I'll talk to you personally. Or one of our elders or another saint here, we would love to talk to you about the faith and what it really is not signing a card. It's not walking up front and saying a prayer. It's not raising your hand. It's an actual transformation where we understand that we can't be justified before God because we have sinned. We think we're good people, but we have sinned. We have lied. We have taken or wanted things that aren't ours. Any, any number of things that God says are sin, we've done. So by rights, a just God, and we all want justice. We call for it out in the streets. We want to see rights made right and wrongs dealt with. God promises to do all these things. But how does he do it with people like me? Walking around saying that I'm justified. How can God say he's just when he saved a man who hated God, who did everything he could to run away and push it, who hated his people? How could he love a person like this and still be called just? by the sinless one taking our place, and same with you. We wonder and we look at people and we see, how could God love this? I know what they've done. I know what this one's done. I've seen the way they live. How in the world could God say this is okay? There's only one way, and that's by sending his son who's done none of it to take it for them. Of course they don't deserve it. Of course we don't look the part. Of course. But that's what salvation is, going to him and saying, this is what I have to offer. I know what you have to offer. I'll take it if you'll have me. And he says, I'll have you. I'll have every one of you. That's our God. Could you stand with me? I'd like to sing a hymn together. Savior, say. Father, we thank you again 
for everything you've done for us. Those who are running, those who are fighting against you even, that you'd choose people like us for your own. Let it always be astounding to us. Let the gospel never, ever get old for us. And Lord, when we fail, as we do often, let it be what drives us to see the cross yet again and just how far the gulf is between us and you and how we could never attain it with the best behavior we could ever work up, that we could never with the best record achieve who you are and your standard. And Lord, let every failure, every stumbling we have, every shortcoming that you reveal in this process, show us that fresh, that as we look at the cross, we see our deep need for a Savior who is all that we need to be and so much more, offering that righteousness to us in exchange for nothing but sin and obedience. Let the wonder of the gospel always break us, always shine out to us, always call to us, always transport us to the throne. Let the gospel always be good news to us, no matter how many times we hear it, how often we review it, how many stumblings it takes for us to see it over and over and over. Let it never lose its luster to us. Let us never forget what you've pulled us from, who we really are, and how in Christ you say that we're perfect. We thank you for these things. We thank you for what you've done. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for leaving heaven to become like us and to become the least of us and to take the place of the worst of us. Lord Jesus, we can't thank you enough, but for those of us who you've transformed, we pledge our obedience to you. Help us to shine light. Help us to represent you well. When we fail, Lord, help us to make it right. Remind us that we haven't stumbled our way out of the kingdom, but God, it's just another reminder of how much we need you and how much we need to cling to the cross. Lord, encourage your saints, your brethren today. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be dismissed. If anyone has any questions about anything we teach, please don't leave without talking to me.